<laughs> How's everybody doing? Good? Yeah. yeah? yeah. All right. All right. Okay, so, uh, yeah, as you said, uh, my name is Chris Borchers. I uh, currently work for the Linux Foundation running the JS Foundation. So uh, we uh, at the JS Foundation are supporting and promoting uh, some of the key projects in the open source JavaScript ecosystem. So that's everything from some of the older uh, but widely used tools like jQuery is one of our projects, uh, all the way to some newer tools in the IoT space, uh, serverless, uh, things like that. So, um, but what I'm gonna focus on today is uh, a project called Interledger.js. Uh, Interledger is uh, an interesting project. It's actually a, a reference implementation for a new protocol that's being worked on called the Interledger Protocol. Um, and so we probably won't talk a lot about JavaScript today. Um, what I'm gonna focus mostly on is, is the protocol because I think that's uh, understanding how this protocol works is important um, and could hopefully inspire you to build some really interesting uh, things. So uh, with that, Interledger itself is a protocol for connecting ledgers. So uh, if you think about the internet as a, a really simple definition, it's a, a protocol, f or uh, the internet is a uh, network of networks. Uh, Interledger is a network of ledgers. Um, and these ledgers are uh, anything you can think of from bank accounts to digital wallets to uh, mobile money accounts. Um, and so what I wanna talk about is how the protocol works to allow these different ledgers to talk to each other. So typically a ledger, like a bank account, uh, keeps track of who you are and balances, right? Um, and so the issue is that not all of these ledgers talk to each other, uh, at least not directly. Um, and we do have technologies like Swift or, or things like that that will transfer funds between ledgers, um, but they're slow uh, and they take time and they're expensive uh, at times. So uh, what Interledger wants to do is try to address that. So Interledger introduces this concept of a connector and a connector can be any sort of individual, uh, an organization, even one of the ledgers themselves could actually become a connector uh, and enable themselves to talk to other ledgers. Uh, these connectors can also do currency conversions. So uh, that starts to become really interesting because now we can do these cross-ledger transactions, cross-currency transactions, cross-border transactions, um, and to the end users, it looks like a local transaction. Um, and so that's kind of the key there. So uh, what you'll see is, uh, like I said, it kind of copies off of the IP protocol uh, that we use on the internet. And so there's an address that looks very much like an IP address. Um, and then an amount, which is just a decimal amount. Um, there isn't a specific currency tied to that amount um, because those local transactions are what deal with uh, currency changes. And so what the sender does is they would attach the interledger packet to their transaction um, when they uh, request money from their ledger to send to a connector. And then the connector would then forward that packet on to the next ledger um, to, to enable sort of that, that transaction. The one concern you might see there is that if I'm sending money to this connector that could be anyone, how do I know that they're actually going to give the money to the person that I'm actually trying to get it to? And ledgers already have this idea of holds built into them. And so by using holds, uh, we can actually then 
uh, map out the entire path of this transaction and keep it secure along the way. And so instead of directly sending funds to the connector, the sender would place a hold on their ledger um, and inform the connector that the funds are on hold and to then pass that transaction on. And so there are different uh, uh, criteria that have to be met to, to move along the transaction path. So uh, there can be expirations, uh, different uh, sort of crypto um, uh, conditions that have to be met in order for the uh, transaction to go through and they can either be executed or rolled back at that time. And so what the packet, uh, the other sort of additional pieces to the interledger packet are an expiration uh, and some sort of condition, which is typically going to be a signature uh, that the recipient and only the recipient can create uh, to then let the sender know that the funds um, have made it. So if we look at this just graphically, so commitment of the transaction happens left to right. And so, uh, like I said, we see the sender put funds on hold um, that they want to send. So Alice is trying to send funds to Bob and Jane is acting as our connector. And so the funds are placed on hold. The connector is notified that there are funds on hold. The connector can then uh, place funds on hold on uh, their ledger and then inform the recipient that those funds are on hold. And so that kind of uh, finalizes commitment. And then the receiver is the one, the recipient is the one that can trigger actual execution of the transaction. And so by actually signing that transaction saying, yes, I uh, know that the conditions have been met, um, that's the right amount that I was expecting, they can then sign the receipt and send that back to the connector. And once the uh, signature is received, the ledger releases those held funds, they go to the recipient. That's when the receipt is passed back on to the connector. The connector sees the signed receipt, sees that it was a successful transaction, sends that back to the sender's ledger, the sender then releases funds that are on hold to reimburse the connector. And then the sender gets a, a proof of payment through that signed receipt that was signed by the recipient to finalize that transaction. So yeah, so transfers uh, are committed left to right and executed right to left. All right, so these paths can be short, so what we showed there was just literally one, a sender, a connector, and a recipient. Um, but because of the way that this is set up, they can be long, and they, it's just a, a repetition of that same process that we saw to pass it along the path to find its way from the sender to the recipient. And so what this allows is for the sender and the recipient to not necessarily have to worry about what currencies they're using. Um, even if it's the sender is sending, uh, say, euro and the recipient wants to receive uh, Bitcoin. Um, these connectors, as long as there's connectors that can go between those, those ledgers, then it can, the transaction can take place. And so, like I said, just like with the internet and how it achieves scale through this sort of network of networks, the same thing is possible through interledger. Um, and so what the interledger would look like is sort of like the internet, where it's this network of connectors and ledgers. So that was just like a really high overview. Um, I'm probably going a little faster than I usually do, but that's okay. Um, but I wanted to point out a couple of actual real-world examples that are currently using Interledger, um, just to kind of illustrate uh, some folks that are using it to hopefully maybe spark some ideas uh, for you. So the first one that I wanted to call out is Codius, 
Um, Codius is an open hosting protocol. So um, you can kind of think of it like uh, AWS Lambda, sort of. Um, but you can run an application on this distributed hosting network where you can choose if you wanted to run on one host or a thousand hosts. Um, and these hosts uh, have uh, payments built in via Interledger. And so through smart contracts, the hosts can say, in order to uh, run your application on, on my host, it will cost you this amount uh, per month. Um, and then in your code, you can agree to that uh, to execute that contract. And then when you push your code to those hosts, uh, your application is tied to some sort of ledger um, and your, the hosts are also tied to a ledger. And then the interledger protocol automatically takes care of those payments. And you can set it up so that people running their applications pay for uh, the hosting. You can have, you can pay for it yourself. You can, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can actually use this system uh, to run distributed applications. Um, it's totally open source. Uh, the, there's a, uh, I think it's called codiushosts.com um, is a cool site to just go take a look at. It actually is a worldwide map and listing of all of the current hosts that are running. I think the last time I checked, there's 400 and something. Um, and it's just this, this organic community that started building up around it. So um, it's pretty cool. The other project that I want to talk about is, is really cool. So to give a little bit of context, there are more than 2 billion people in the world that do not have a bank account and do not have access to other sort of digital financial services. Um, and so digital payment technologies are, are a way to address that because a lot of times the reason these people don't have access to these digital services, these financial services, is because they are in remote areas. It's really hard for banks to um, justify standing up uh, a, a physical location in some of these places. It's prohibitively expensive for these people to actually get to a physical location. Um, and when it comes to digital services, because of the way that the current systems are set up, a lot of times the fees uh, associated with these digital financial services are too high for these people to actually use them. Um, but because the, the digital payments can reduce uh, some of the, the cost by about 90% as opposed to, to physical transactions, um, that, that pro, the prohibitive sort of uh, issues around fees and physical locations has made digital financial service growth in developing countries really slow. Um, and so what becomes interesting is uh, 90 percent of the less fortunate in the world um, in developing countries are now covered by a mobile signal and so mobile money uh, has become has been growing and growing um, really well in these areas the issue there is that a lot of these are closed systems and they don't talk to each other and so I may be able to open uh, a mobile money account but my uh, child's school may have a different uh, mobile money and they don't talk to each other. Or my employer might want to pay me digitally, but they can't because their bank doesn't talk to my mobile money system. And so this is where uh, Interledger can come in and this is where Moja Loop comes in. So um, Moja is Swahili for one and uh, what they've, they've done is, is to look at these closed systems, these closed individual uh, systems and try to create one loop uh, within some of these countries to have these different digital financial systems talk to each other. Um, so it's really interesting, and this is all uh, 
in part due to interledger because it allows these different systems to talk to each other uh, through that connector uh, protocol. So um, I guess what I would leave you with is just what could you build with this? Um, it could be anything that helps your, your company, your, your employer, um, or something like MojoLoop trying to help uh, people around the world. So with that, I say thank you. Thank you.